God bless you, you Brother much, Brandon. Brother. Lord bless you. God. You know, it's written in the Word. I was happy when they said unto us, let's go to the house of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This lovely place, lovely atmosphere, lovely pastor in this choir. Such a nice church. I don't see why there would be anything lacking this morning for all that we have needed on. I sure appreciate that song, God is Sufficient. Isn't that beautiful? Sang so nicely. And they have consecrated voices. I like that. I like something that's real that hasn't got any, you know, put on. You don't have. I like good singing, but I, I just can't stand an overtrained voice. You know. <laughs> you know, I hold till it gets blue in the face, and you know, and some kind of a gargle or a warble or something, and, and that's not singing. I, I like singing like that. Just real, right in the heart, good old-fashioned Pentecostal singing. Brother Fred Softman, you here? Somewhere, one of my trustees. Look around this place. This is where I like for our church to be built at home. With all these Sunday school rooms and things back here like that. I like that. At, uh, coming up a while ago, I noticed that we're in the process of building a new church. And I, I like this. I like those pews and the rugs, the way they're fixed. It's nice. And uh, I'm not saying that complimentary it's so much as I am. I'm just telling the truth. I, I like that. I, just, I like that. Uh, I think this is where I'm supposed to be first. I'm just about ten days late. <laughs> That's me, <laughs> usually late. And But uh, two things that I've learned this morning, uh, this being the... Uh, one of the churches of God from uh, Cleveland, Tennessee. Those people has been a blessing to me around the world. I remember one run-in we had with uh, when we first got acquainted here some years ago, Brother Gordon Lindsay, which is associated with the Assemblies of God. He sent me up to um, Chattanooga and... Uh, he said there was uh, going to have a meeting there, and they had a great auditorium. So I sent uh, Brother Baxter, which was speaking for me at that time, on uh, to Chattanooga, and he called me back. He said, Brother Bram, we got an auditorium where seat 6,500 people. We got one church on a sponsorship, and it's a little church in a basement, in a basement just a, um, probably about 35 in membership. That is that's nice, but said, that's all on the sponsorship. And I said, well, I'll be up tomorrow. And I flew in, and the next morning I had the privilege of speaking at the Lee College. That's one of the big colleges. And oh, what a fine student body that was. And the next night, when they come in, they was backed out on the street. They just couldn't even get room to sit down anywhere. They really come to my rescue then. All that auditorium was one little bitty church on sponsorship, and they all come together, and we really had a glorious time, and that was my first contact right straight with the headquarters of the Church of God. I like that name, the Church of God. I, I like that for a name, and I appreciate them very much. You know, I guess Brother David Littlefield, and he's such a bosom friend of mine. He comes to my house all the time. We have fellowship one with another uh, up there, and... Uh, he just built a new church, and I had the privilege of dedicating it to the Lord recently. And so we are happy to be here today in this fine atmosphere of worship and appreciate so much the, the attendance of these churches since we've been in the city and throughout the Maricopa Valley, such a wonderful fellowship. I said the other day that I think the word phoenix means something that's come up out of nothing. Uh, that might be the wrong expression, but I think that's something on that order. That this city was built out of a, a desert here, just right in the middle of a desert, so it rose up out of chaos. And a few years ago, I come into the city, some 10 or 15 years ago, and the churches was kind of battling with each other. You could hardly get... They said, but this group's going to do the cooperation. We're out, see? And so, but now I find out that there's another phoenix as rails up. <laughs> Such a brotherhood, a fellowship among the brethren. All the churches together, I, 
Notice night after night and places how the... Now, it falls kind of hard on our precious brother here because this is on Sunday morning to be here. And, and uh, I, we've always said every person should be at their post of duty on Sunday morning. I think any time you got service, your own church should be your, at, your, at your lookout. That's your place where you should stay. And I've always thought that. In my campaigns, I usually close them on Sunday afternoon. So that on Sundays, the afternoon service, so that it wouldn't bother the Sunday churches and then send all the delegates from all over the country into the different churches to cooperate. That's fellowship together. I love that. And now, today, to be here and to enjoy this time of fellowship just before going for the final closing of my part, as far as I know, at the Full Gospel Businessman a service. And... We're hoping, believing that God will meet with us this afternoon over there and help us to bring something that will be beneficiary because sitting among those people are Episcopalians, Catholics, Lutheran, what more. And we are trusting that maybe God will just move down in a, some Amen. way that will bring many in. I'd like to say this right now. I never felt any more home in my life, so <laughs> standing here. So, um, have you noticed in the fellowship of the full gospel businessmen brethren that um, they are they are bringing in seemingly like uh, the ecumenical world, the Episcopalian, Presbyterian? Do you see the the hunger and the Church of Christ? Hundreds of them met last night in Dallas to seek for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The ones who sought me all across the country on the divine alien, you, brother. And now, you see, I believe, oh, since they have begun to see our fellowship, our union, and God with us, there's nothing they say against it because it's just happening, that's all. And I think that's wonderful. But now, to the church of the living God, all those that are in Christ, I would like to make this little statement. Did you realize the hour? There's so many people, when you get amongst just man like that and people that from the different churches, they're not spiritual enough to catch the discernment of it. See? They don't get it. They like to laugh and praise the Lord and shout and the joy of the Lord. That's fine. But to get down and find out where that comes from, see? get down and realize what that means. Everything's set in order in God. He's right on time. One time... I was preaching on the subject of the eleventh command, or the the forgotten beatitude. It was in the eleventh chapter of Matthew, the sixth verse. It said that uh, John sent his disciples over to find out, asked Jesus, was he really the Messiah or not? And Jesus never gave John a book on how to behave in church or how to behave in prison or or so forth. He just said, stay till the service is over, and then you make up your own mind. See, so. Things taking place, so went back across the hill as they did, and he began to say, who'd you go out to see? What went you out to see? A uh, uh, man clothed in soft raiment, said, there king's palaces. Did you go to see a prophet? said, more than a prophet. And he began to, to praise John after John had given him a, the lowest uh, thing that he could almost, the worst thing he could say about Jesus was question him after he had introduced him, and then Jesus turning right around and know that John was exactly the spirit of Elijah. Both of them went forth blasting this as hard as they could and, and cutting and letting the chips fall where they wanted to. And then, you notice, as immediately after Elijah's ministry with that Jezebel and all the people try to pattern after her and everything, how he must have rammed and cut that gospel in there that day. And then finally, after he done proved God that was God, God come down to vindicate that he was God. Then he had a nervous breakdown. He went out and sat under the juniper tree and wanted to die and, and prayed for God to take his life. And 40 days and nights is out there in the wilderness wandering around and God found him pulled back in a cave somewhere. Do you notice John coming the same way? Notice how he come? Just the same way, cutting and slashing and, and saying, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And, and that finally had his head cut off. And when they throw him in prison, as soon as he had proved God and introduced and said, this is Messiah, I believe it, 
in Pimmerman's early ages, uh, one of the great writers said, the John, all prophets are eagles. Of course, they have to go high to see far away. And he said his eagle eye got thimmed over in that prison. But what it was, he was exactly the type of Elijah. You see, he had to have that shaken up condition. Then we see today, do you realize that all these years that we have fought for this ministry, for this baptism of the Holy Ghost, the Pentecostal blessings and things, it's sad as we look upon our church and see that many of them are, are falling away. But yet in the midst of that, we look out here and we're getting our eyes think about the ecumenical world coming in, the Presbyterians and Luthers. But turn that around now. If you got spiritual discernment and look at the hour, it shows we're here. The very hour that when the sleeping virgin come to get the oral and went out to buy it, that's when the bridegroom comes. Right. Amen. Amen. See, when you see the Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians and so forth seeking after the Holy Ghost, be careful. That's the hour when the sleeping virgin began to come and they said, give us your oil. I said, now you go get it the same way where we got it. And when they went after it, it is that very hour that the bridegroom came and the bride was taken in and they were left out where there's weeping, wailing, and gnashing Amen. Teeth. I wonder if my Pentecostal people have their eyes open to such as that oh. to realize we're right on the, the verge of his appearing. Just at any time. Nothing else left. Yes, amen. We've just been through the seven church ages at home and all those things and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit seeing each age and how it divided itself and down into this Lady Osea church age and see Christ been put out of his own church and stand at the door knocking trying to get back in his own oh. church and seeing exactly the message and what would go forth in that day and how that the Sleeping virgin would act and all these things and that and see it everything right ready right now. Just that the rapture could come at any time. Amen. Right. Amen. I'm so glad. All they that love his appearing. <laughs> Someone said to me, they said, Brother Branham, you scare people. I said, What do you mean? He said, Well, saying that Jesus might come any time. I said, Are you a Christian? Yes, but my there's a lot of work to be done. I said, just a minute. I said, the greatest event that could ever take place, it thrills my heart more than anything else to know the appearing of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's right. Amen. Why, this mortal will take on immortality. Uh, old age will drop away from it. <laughs> uh, well, we'll, we'll be made in the likeness of the Son of God and we'll see Him as He is and through there'll be no more time, space, and eternity. Why, what? My, there'd be something mentally wrong with a person that didn't love his appearing. That is, if you're right to, if, you're, if your soul is right, it's a longing. Could you imagine a man being away from his wife for years, a lovely, sweet wife, and knowing at any moment that he will appear and she's going to see him, and oh, our whole anticipations are setting right on seeing him right at once, you see, just looking for him to appear at any time. Our girl... Her boyfriend's been gone. They're fixing to get married. Just as soon as he arrives, they're going to be married. Whoa, my. How she's got everything ready, mine ready. That, while there's nothing in the world means anything to her, but just that boy appearing, that's all. Well, that's the way the church should be. Right, amen. Yeah. amen. We should just love his appearing, right? Paul said, there's a crown laid up for me that the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me it that day, not only to him, but all those who love. His appearing. I, I like that so well. Well, look here. I, the only thing, I'm so slow to get started, and that's a long to get stopped. And I, <clears throat> I'm so glad that you all believe in grace, <laughs> and, and you bear with me. Now, we won't take but just a short time and hear it with the church, and I, I wish if it wasn't just for speaking to you and promised I had... I just like to hear this little choir sing the rest of the time and, and, the, uh, and the church out there testify of the glory of God and what's been happening among you. Oh, that would just be dandy. I just, I just settle it right there for that to see that happen. You know, we ministers many times, especially evangelists, 
We're always going to church and have to just keep preaching, preaching, preaching. We never get to sit down and warm ourselves by the fire in the church, you know, just um, build up. You know, and like uh, they claim that Pentecost now is something many of the people say it was something that was. And uh, way years ago, 2,000 years ago, they had a Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit fell upon the people, and, and they did great things. Well, now, you can't uh, get warm by a painted fire. <laughs> that's right. No, you'll freeze right. to death. Amen. See, that's, just something, that's painted as something it was. And um, if the God that was with them then isn't the same one today, then it's just like feeding your canary bird uh, vitamins to give him good strong wings and good bones and a lot of feathers and keep him in a cage. <laughs> it doesn't do very much good to give him good wing feathers if you're not going to let him fly a little. <laughs> so I think that's the way we should just uh, come to a place where we let the Holy Spirit Hallelujah. come in and work among Amen. us and Amen. do something for us. Now, we're going to read just a moment uh, a scripture and just speak to you a few moments and then in about... Two o'clock, got to go home and eat dinner, and then come back at two o'clock. I got to be again at the businessman's meeting to speak this afternoon. <clears throat> now let us bow our heads just a moment before we pray. And I wonder this morning in the solemnness of this uh, moment that if upon our hearts that we have a burden that we'd like God to know about and you'd like to be remembered in prayer. If you just raise your hand. The Lord bless you. Oh. Almighty and all omnipotent God, oh. the infinite one who was before there was a world, a atom or a molecule, he set there in eternity the great I am. How we thank Thee today that Thou has made a way for us to come to Thee and, and be able to have an interview with Thee. For it was said by your, your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus, our Savior, if you ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. Then we're asking in Jesus' name for just a little talk with you, Lord. Because we love you and we want to express ourselves to you. We love thee because thou didst love us and we would not have been here if it had not been for thee. Then when we came in the way that we got here, then Jesus came to redeem us back to this loving Father. And we would ask this morning that in the light of the sanctifying power of his blood that you would cleanse us from all of our evil. Anything that we have done, thought, or said that was contrary to Thee. And Father God, we know that that would be many things. For a great, holy God, that even angels look dirty to Him. Where would we stand? But today we have the privilege of coming beyond the angels because Jesus never died for angels. And angels are servants. And by the blood of Jesus, we are sons and daughters. And we come into thy presence to say, Thank you, Father, for what you have done for us, what you mean to us. And we know that behind each hand this morning there was a great desire. I pray, Father, that you will grant the desire of their hearts. We thank thee for this place here, this church this part of the body of the Lord Jesus, for, all, for its pastor, for its deacons, trustees, and all the members that come here, for all the people that's gathered under its roof this morning, this building, I pray that you will bless them exceedingly abundantly. May it be the house of prayer. As Jesus said, it's written, My Father's house shall be called the house of prayer. May from here go ministers to all parts of the world. May the dewdrops of mercy be so real here until the honeybees that seeking food come in here from all parts of the city to find rest for their souls, food for their souls. Grant it, Lord. Now, 
We would ask to bless these few words that we're to read, Lord. I pray that you'll sanctify them to plant seeds into the hearts of the people that it may grow into great trees. For the glory of God, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In Romans, the third chapter, verse 3, I read these words. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without an effect? I'm going to speak this morning on, for just a few moments, on unbelief does not hinder God. Some might think it does, but it does not. God has a program. And his program is, John said he's able of these stones to write children to Abraham. Right. His program will go on just the same. <clears throat> Unbelief is as old as Eden. That's where it was born at, was in Eden. And unbelief is to doubt what God has said. Now, did you notice... Where unbelief was born, there was much of the Word of God considered. For Satan said to Eve, when she said, God has said, he did not deny that, that God has said so and so. But he said, surely God wouldn't do a thing like that. See, that was a birth of unbelief to very one iota from God's perfect Word. We must stay right with it, regardless of where or what or how our lives and so forth must measure up with, Thus saith the Lord. Amen. And if we should have any revelation should be presented to us, that's contrary to the written Word, then we should never receive it. Because that's exactly what Satan did to Eve. She had the Word. But she was hunting for some new light. And Satan seen to it that she got it. So we never want to add anything to the Word or Amen. take anything from the Word, but just leave it the way it is. Amen. Stay right with the Word. For anything contrary is unbelief. Now we are knowing that in this last days and looking for it have been we brethren, ministers, who are trying to live as close to God as we can because we have a sacred duty to watch over the flock of God which the Holy Spirit has made us overseers. We watch the flock to keep them in order, to feed them sheep's food. And sheep eats from the Bible the lambs of God. Amen. Jesus Amen. said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Right on the word. And Paul said in Galatians 1.8, If an angel would bring any other gospel to you than that which has already been given, then let him be accursed. Amen. See? How firm that commandment is. That we must stay right with the Word. Don't move from it. And Eve just shadowly moved. Perhaps, maybe, God would just uh, overlook that. We hear so much today about God being a good God. And that's true. He is a good wow. God. We believe that. But He's also a God of judgment. Yes. In order to be good, He has to bring judgment. To keep his law, there must, be, there must be penalty to law, or law is not affected. If there's a, a law that says to run a, a stoplight is against the law, then if there's no uh, penalty to that law to be executed, then the law is no good at all. Right. You just might as well run it or anything you want to, because there's no law. But when you 
trespass across that word of God to some creed or tradition, you have passed over that line between mercy and judgment. Amen. Right. You must stay right in the word. I like that. Right Hallelujah. with the word. Amen. Not one jot shall or tittle shall no wise pass away. Heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall not fail. It's got to be. How we could take hours here to go back and base how that, if we had time, of how that uh, science, years passed by, has tried to ridicule the very thoughts of God, making themselves some great name, some achievement that they could uh, do themselves. But right while they are digging and trying to disprove the Word, God turns right around and let them dig up something to prove it. Hallelujah. So a few years ago when the Pentecostal church was born, they, they said it's a, a bunch of fanaticism. It, it'll never stand. Not knowing that it was God's move. God had to do that. That's the time for it. It's the age for it. As I said somewhere not long ago in one of the meetings, maybe here, that John was so sure that was Jesus, but even before he saw the sign of the Messiah, that dove, God descending from heaven in the form of a dove, the Holy Spirit, coming out of heaven, voice saying, This is my beloved Son. That was what he was supposed to see. The Father told him that in the wilderness, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit. But John was so sure. They asked him, said, aren't you that Messiah? Aren't you the, that prophet was to come? Aren't you uh, uh, this and that? He said, I'm not. But said, there's one standing among you now. Amen. See, he knew the time was so close until there, that one was already in the midst of the people. Yeah. Because he was to introduce him. And he knew that he was there. And I believe that that's what the great church of the living God has done in this last days. It's to bring to the people the recognition of the living God among the church. Amen. See, Amen. That's what it's raised up for. And that church is to come back not to a creed like the Roman dogma or something. It's to come back to the Bible. Amen. Amen. Get back to the Word. No matter what it says, just, just cope with the Word. Not to use our own thinking. Stay with the Word. Amen. Because it's the promise of God. Now, unbelief is an old thing. Way back in Eden, and it first come in so cunning, almost truth. Now, if uh, someone said, uh, uh, Brother Branham went up to the church of God this morning, correctly. He met the pastor. Yes, had on a dark suit and tie. Yes, that's true. Uh, he sat down on the right side of the pastor, correctly. Got up and spoke. Yes. And... Uh, Maybe um, all of that's true, every bit of it. Then it say just before, when he come to the door, when he got to the door there, he uh, took a drink out of a bottle. Now, there is the lie. But all the rest of it is so true. See, the rest of it's so perfectly true that that one little thing besets the whole thing and makes it a lie. Well, that's the way the devil does. He brings us down to everything and shows it so lovely and will go in and agree with most of the Word of God, but he won't take all the Word of God. That's what we've got to do. He'll say, I believe that there is such a thing as new birth, but what I think it is is a change of mind. But it is a change of mind. It's a new creature. It isn't... The, the church doesn't need a, a facelifting. It needs a conversion. Amen. It needs to be a new creature. And 
Unbelief will push you over to one side. Many of them say, well, now I believe that we believe in the Holy Ghost in our place, but we believe that when we believe God, we receive the Holy Ghost. Now, you see how close that is? What if the disciples, after six days, Matthew said to, to Andrew, you know what? I believe we've already got it. <laughs> Let's accept it by faith. See, it would have never happened. Right. See, the only way that they knew how it would be when it comes, they had the Scriptures to prove what it would be when it comes. That's right. Joel said, it shall come to pass, Joel 2.28, shall come to pass the last days I pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Amen. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Upon my handsmaids and maidservants will I pour out of my Spirit. And I'll show signs in the heavens and in the earth and so forth. Isaiah 28, 18 said, And it shall come to pass in these last days that the tables would be full of vomit and so forth. And he said, But the Word would come. Amen. Precept Amen. upon precept. Line upon line upon line. Here a little and there a little, and hold fast to that what's good. Amen. For with stammering lips and other tongues will I speak to this people, and this is the rest. Amen. This is Amen. the keeping of a Sabbath that you should enter into. For all this they wouldn't understand it, walked away, wagging their heads, and so forth. So you see, those disciples were trained to the Word. Amen. And we know that in this last days, that what is going to take this... this am I, I'm, I hope I'm not doing anything wrong. <laughs> in the last days, what is going to take the stand is a scriptural trained church right. Amen. Amen. on the line. For there's going to be carnal impersonations rise. Right. The Bible said, as Jambres and Jambres withstood Moses, so will these men of reprobate mind concerning the truth. Amen. And Jesus was the truth. Thy word is the truth. Because in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And the word of God is more powerful than a two-edged sword, cutting to the sun of the bone, and a discerner of the thoughts of the heart. We realize that we're in that day to work. Anything can look so real. But yet, if it's off the Scripture, leave it alone. Right. No matter what kind of a sensation, what results you find out of it, if it isn't Scripture, stay away from it. Amen. Amen. Stay right Amen. with the Word. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, you say that you're getting the people unbelief. No, I'm trying to get them to faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the creed. That might be in the almanac, but that's not the Bible. Hmm? Hearing the Word of God. Amen. That's what Amen. brings faith. Amen. You hear the Word of God. That brings faith. Now, with about 12 minutes more left, I... Now, I, I'm too slow again. Unbelief doesn't destroy God. It doesn't destroy His plan. It doesn't destroy His works. It only uh, destroys the unbeliever. Right. Amen. Unbelief Amen. only destroys the unbeliever. Right. One said to me not long ago, Pastor, he said, I belong to a certain fine organization, and he said, we offer anybody a thousand dollars cash who can produce, just before my broadcast, can produce one cure by divine healing. And we'll pay it off. And he knew I was coming on behind him at Jonesboro, Arkansas. And I went on my broadcast, and immediately after broadcast, I went and got a physician of the city to a man that had cancer on his neck and while I was praying for him, it dropped off his neck and rolled down the floor. The newspapers rolled it up. So I asked the doctor, his doctor, which was a friend to him, and I said, Doctor, I talked to him many times. This is another meeting after that had taken place. 
I said, you remember the case? He said, well, can you contribute anything, any medical science that would do that? I said, no, sir, I cannot. <laughs> then it would have to be some supernatural something to do it. He said, correctly. I said, I'll pay you for your time. <laughs> I want to collect $1,000 from the missionaries. <laughs> Well, when I got to the pastor's study, he never seen me. And he said, uh, I said, I heard uh, your broadcast that you would give $1,000 to anyone that could produce uh, uh, proof of divine healing. Yes. I said, uh, you can, might make me the check if you please. <laughs> I said, here is the man, here is his doctor. Then find out the thousand dollars was over somewhere in Texas and something like that. He said, "Let me see you. I'll bring a little girl in here, and let me cut her hand, and let me see you heal it. Then I'll believe." I said, "You are in bad need of mental healing." <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, anybody cut a child's hand. That's that same old devil. Right. Said, Amen. "If thou be the Son of God." Well, let's uh, do this a miracle here before us. Let, let, let's see these stones turn into bread. See? Uh, if thou be the Son of God, Amen. come off the cross. We, we'll believe you. Amen. He could have done it. Amen. But he'd been listening to the devil. He said, I do nothing till the Father shows me. See? That's right. I do what he tells me to do. So you see, when these influences come up, and try to tell you this, that, and the other, and don't you believe it? God's Word. Amen. This minister said to me, he said, I don't care when I went off his porch how many things you could produce. I still don't believe it. I said, certainly not. You're an unbeliever. It was not sent to unbelievers, sir. It was only sent to believers. That's all the ones going to ever see it. A little while and the world seeth me no more, the unbeliever. But ye shall see me, for I'll be with you. Even to the consummation, the end of the time. God, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he lives, won't he produce the same thing? Won't his life Glory. produce as it did if it's living in you? Now, it just destroys the unbeliever. And it did just that in the days of Noah. Noah was a preacher of righteousness who heard the word of the Lord and prepared an ark for the saving of his household. And what did he do? While he prepared this ark, he preached to the unbelievers. Amen. Now, Noah was a critical, uh, radical up to those unbelievers. But the only thing their unbelief did was bring judgment on the earth. Amen. Amen. And the very judgment that destroyed the unbeliever was the only means of saving Noah. Amen. The very waters of judgment that destroyed the unbeliever was the thing that flowed in Noah's ark. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So it just destroys the unbeliever. It doesn't have nothing to do with God. It don't stop him. He goes on just the same. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Now, faith, faith is ridiculous to everybody but God and the one that has it. Now, it's not ridiculous to God because he's the author of faith. And it's not ridiculous to the man that has the faith because he's a believer in God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So it isn't ridiculous to him. God is the author of it. He created it. And the man who received it from God, of course, it isn't, uh, it isn't ridiculous to God because he created it. He knows what it is. And the believer that receives it, it isn't ridiculous to him because by that, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things he can't see, taste, feel, smell, or hear. Amen. But he knows it's there. Amen. It's not ridiculous to him because it's just as good as done. He don't have to worry anything about it. Uh, he knows God told it. And God said it. That's enough for him. All right. So we want to have faith. God wants us to have faith. And unbelief won't destroy his plans. It won't do a thing to him. He'll go right on just the same. Amen. I like to see for somebody to take their unbelief and stop the sun. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, you say you're a faith. Oh, yes, it did. Joshua, he did. 
Faith will do it. But your unbelief will get nowhere. No. See a cloud coming up and see if your unbelief. <laughs> that isn't going to rain. See if it don't rain just the same. Well, you say, would it do any good? Oh, yes. Faith will do it. Hallelujah. See, unbelief has no value in it at all. You're, you're controlled by two elements. Either you believe or you do not believe. Now let's take unbelief and see what it does. It creates a weary. It brings uh, oppression. And it can't help you at all. There's no value in unbelief at all. If uh, you say if you were going to be shot in the morning at sunrise, it wouldn't, it wouldn't help you any to worry about it. Not a bit. It only... Just make it worse on you. So you, you can't do that. Not good to do it. What do you say? What does faith do? It, what does the Word of God do? It creates a faith. Yes, amen. Well, what could faith do is you go be shot in the morning if you deliver me. Has done it many times. Hallelujah. Sure. See, there's no value in unbelief. All the value there is is in faith believing God's Word. Taking God at His Word. Now... Here some time ago, before they condemned the Statue of Liberty, a uh, present from France to the United States, now it's condemned, I understand. She can't go up in it. I had the privilege of going in it one time. And I went up into the arm of the, of the statue. And then out there, we walked out in a little place, the guide and I, and there was a, a window. And I was looking out across and thinking about my cousin when he came home from the army. Out there all beat up and shot. But when the ship was coming in towards the shore, he said, Billy, they, they, they rolled the wheelchairs and the, and the stretcher cases up on top when we could see way in the distance. In the First World War, that's before the big buildings had come into New York so big yet, and they could see that Statue of Liberty rising up out of the water. Hallelujah. He said they began to play, My country, it is of thee. Sweet land of liberty, oh, veterans cut, bruised, shot, crippled. When they seen that statue rise up in the water like that, they just fell down and started screaming. Why, right behind that, mother waited, sweetheart waited, Hallelujah. wife waited, Hallelujah. babies waited. I thought if it make a soldier feel like that, what won't it be when we see the old rugged cross hanging there? A veteran pulling in from the cuts and bruises of the battlefield. Oh, I want to stand on the deck of the old ship of Zion and raise my hand and say, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Praise God. Oh, how I love Jesus. Praise God. I was looking out through that window and thinking of that, and I noticed. Laying down here along the side was a bunch of little dead sparrows. And they looked like they'd just been killed. And I said to the guide, I said, uh, uh, those sparrows, did you poison them? He said, no, no, we didn't poison them. And I said, well, why are they laying dead just around this window here? He said, uh, they beat their brains out on the window. And I said, how did that come? He said, Night before last, there was a storm. I said, when the storm was a blowing and the winds a twisting and the trees a shaking and the lightning a flashing, he said, those little birds trying to find shelter said they got in the light of this beacon and said, and, and if they were just to use the light to find safety, They'd have been safe. But what they tried to do was fly up and beat the light out. And it only blinded them. And they beat their little brains out and laying dead. I never said nothing right then. But I thought, how true it is. Amen. Unbelievers, Amen. instead of trying to take the beacon light, God's Amen. Word is a light, Amen. trying to take that beacon and go to safety with it to Christ, Amen. they beat their brains out, <coughs> die in sin and disgrace, amen, amen. trying to beat the light out when it would be totally impossible. There can't be enough infidels, right? 
enough devils come out of hell to ever beat that Amen. light of the world. Amen. I Amen. am the light of the world. Hallelujah. And never beat it out. So there's only one thing to do. When it shines on your pathway, follow it. The name of the Lord is a mighty tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. If ye abide in me in the tower, my words abide in you, then you can ask what you will. It'll be done for you. Many times I've been considered, now I'm just say this like I would at my tabernacle, I wouldn't feel any more at home at tabernacle. Brother Ram, how does these things happen? What takes place of this and how this takes place? It's just abiding in Jesus. Amen. Believing His Amen. Word. Amen. He promised to do it, and He'll do it. Now, I have to hurry. All right. Jesus came in the world. Just about one more comment. i got about 50 scriptures wrote out here on this. <laughs> but i am just got certain scriptures, and I can look down here and refer to it. Now, Jesus, when He came into the world, He came in the time of a massive unbelief. That's right. That's right. He came in such a way that it caused the unbeliever to disbelieve more. God just pulled the... <laughs> He's such a wonderful Father. Brought right in the time and gave him, a, as the people thought, an illegitimate child. And never sent him into any schools and so forth. And he was an odd sort of a boy. But yet there was something about him that seemed to be that what he said was truth. Amen. What he spoke, it was so. And he never took credit for himself, but connected himself with God. It's not me that doeth the works, he Amen. said. You claim God to be your father. And you say he is. Then you don't believe me. If you can't believe me, believe the works that I do. Amen. They are my credentials. They are the one that testifies of me. They are the one that Wait. speaks whether it's truth or not. Read the scriptures what the Messiah was to do. Search the scriptures, for in them... You think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. So he was the living Word of God. They are they that testify of me. The Scripture. Unbelief never stopped him. He just kept right on going. He healed the sick, raised the dead, cleansed the lepers, went right on. And when they didn't believe that such things could happen, and their unbelief didn't stop Jesus at all, he went right on, doing just what he was supposed to do. Never bothered him a bit. Now, there has to be unbelievers. God predicted that. And there's going to be ten unbelievers to one believer. More than that. Maybe a thousand to one. Because the church is in the minority. Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good will to give you the kingdom. So don't look for great Big something. The devil's always after something big. But God makes himself small. God. God, a baby in a manger. Jehovah crying. <laughs> Could you imagine? Jehovah playing as a teenage boy. It was God. God was in him. God. That's right. He come to express God. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So just look at the uh, what K. Ephesus could have called together what call a great campaign. Sometimes pastors like this of an ordinary sized church, sometimes they maybe get the idea that because that I'm not out like uh, Billy Graham or Oral Roberts or something like that, maybe God doesn't love me as well. Listen, don't you never believe that? Right. Amen. Some of the most Powerful meetings I ever had was in little bitty churches. Sometimes seven or eight of us in a home somewhere praying. See, God promised together, no matter how small the church was, He promised together with us. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in their midst. Amen. All right. To stop, I say this. Unbelief 
does not stop God, does not stop his program, does not stop his move, does not stop nothing but the unbeliever. It stops him in his sin, and there he is, standing looking at himself. Today they say there is no such a thing as the Holy Ghost. But that don't stop it. Amen. The people go right on getting it just the same. <laughs> Hallelujah. They say there's no divine healing, but they go right on getting healed just the same. God. They say there's no joy. People go right on shouting just the same. There's no such a thing as this baptism of the Holy Ghost that you Pentecostals talk about. But the people are filled with it every day. Hallelujah. They might not be able to explain it, but they know they got it. That's the main thing. So unbelief doesn't stop God. Hallelujah. We know we got it. I'm so glad to associate myself with people who has it. Let us pray. Do you love him? Raise up your hand. Our Heavenly Father, we are so happy this morning to know that there's no way to explain God. We can't scientifically bring God down. Moses couldn't have tucked leaves off the tree down to the laboratory to find out what kind of a spray had been put on those leaves that they didn't burn. He didn't try to. He just sat down and talked to us. Oh, God, grant that these poor, humble souls in Phoenix, straying up and down these streets, or strolling, rather, up and down these streets, seemingly nowhere to go, nothing to do, may they hear the voice of God from this tabernacle and others in this city and see the fire of God upon the people. See the people how they act after they have received it. Their lives are a burning bush. May they not try to scientifically see what it's all about, but may they just come into the chapel and sit down, talk to it. I'm sure they'll find like Moses that he said, I am that I am. I am never began or never ends. He always was and always will be. We believe in you, God. And we pray that you will increase our faith, that God's great mercy will continue to be with us. Bless this people in here this morning and sanctify the, the believer in such a capacity that all the great powers of God can be let loose in their lives, that they will be living epistles read of all men, and the Word of God can live in their hearts and lives. Bless our gracious and beloved brother here, the pastor. I pray, God, that you give him the desire of his heart to him and his loved ones and to his church. Grant it, Lord. Forgive us of our shortcomings and condition our souls for the oncoming filling of the Spirit as we believe that will soon come cause the enemies begin to come in like a flood and they said they would raise up a, the Spirit of God and raise up a standard against it. We're looking in this last days that we express when the sleeping virgin begins to cry out for oral then we know the time is at hand. So Lord... We're taking inventory right now. Are we believers? Do we believe the full word? Fill our lamps so full that we'll give light in darkness. Bless the gathering this afternoon at the businessmen's fellowship meeting. I pray, God, that you'll uh, save many souls this afternoon. And, Father God, I pray that you'll come back to this chapel here tonight with the people and with other places throughout the city where the people are meeting. Grant it, Father. And someday we trust that we will, when these words that's been said this morning, and this tape is played yonder somewhere in God's big sky, that we will all be there without a spot or a wrinkle in trusting in the merits of Jesus alone. Grant it. In his name we ask it. Amen. God bless you. Do you love him? Amen. I'd like for you to do something to me just before I turn the service to the pastor. I know it's 12 o'clock and it's time for us to be leaving. He, I think he has something else he wanted to do or say.
But just before I leave to go to get ready for this other meeting coming up, uh, I'd like for you to do me a favor. This little choir, I want to comment you, sir, on a nice-looking choir, clean, washed up. <laughs> may think I'm crazy, but if I am, I'm still writing the words. <laughs> uh -huh. Let's sing with all of our hearts. I love him. The pianist sister, would you get there? I love him. I love him because he first loved me. I just love that, don't you? Oh, I'm a Kentuckian. Is there any Kentuckians in here? Well, bless your heart. No wonder Arizona's getting along so well. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Brother Ed Hooper, I thought I'd seen you. Oh, you're just a little bit farther up from Kentucky. Uh, I was thinking of him being a Kentuckian, too, but I believe you're from up around um, Carolina somewhere up there, best I remember. All right, everyone from the depths of your heart now, all together now, the way we sing it down on the branch with the forks of the creek. Now, everybody, everybody now. I beautiful. You know, I used to have an old preacher that come to see me. I, he'd preach a little bit and then run back and shake my hand and say, Glory to God, and then run out and preach a little more. Old Brother Ryan. And I used to think one day, I said, uh, Brother Ryan, I, I want to ask you something. Why do you run back and shake my hands all the time? I said, uh, my, my battery gets low. I need a little charge in these hands. <laughs> so this is charging me for this afternoon, you see. Let's sing it with our hands up. How many like the handshake? You like that? Oh, I, you know, I used to be a Baptist, but I was kind of the handshaking Baptist, but that never where it come from. I like a good handshake. Some time ago, my wife ain't with me this morning, and Sister Stockman, you know what you tell her, you see. I went downtown with her. I love this good old-fashioned handshake, you know. I, I went downtown, and, and a lady said, Hello, Sister Branham. And I didn't hear her say anything. I said, honey, that, that, that lady spoke to you. She said, I spoke to her. Well, I said, I'm sure she didn't hear it. I didn't. I'm sitting this close to you. She said, oh, I smiled. I said, now, a little silly grin. <laughs> I, 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 like, I like a real handshake, don't you? Don't you like that? <laughs> Some time ago, way down. Uh, this is horrible, Pastor. You forget. <laughs> way down. I was, went down in Florida. We was having a meeting, and we had a big tent out there about... Oh, many thousands of people had gathered for healing. And, the, you know, the healing services, you know how they are, pulling and twisting. And there was uh, one of the brothers come to me and said, The Duchess wants to see you. I said, The what? I didn't know what the brother was talking about. said, The Duchess. I said, What's the Duchess? I thought it might be a Dutchman, like to call the lost Dutchman. Or something. Could have been a lost Dutchman, too, you know. So I said, uh, I don't understand it. He said, well, it's, it's a woman that owns all this property through here. And I said, well, uh, look, there's about 5,000 sick people out there trying to get in, too. Oh, he said, uh, but this is the Duchess. You must see her. And I said, oh, I said, she's no more than anyone else. Is she? See, she's just a human being. And he said, as you go out through the tent here, she'll be there. And I looked at her. she come up. Now, nah, uh, please don't think this is sacrilegious. I hope it don't sound that way. But she had a pair of glasses on a stick. 
Now, you know you ain't going to look through no stick out like that. I had glasses on a stick like this. And she said, oh, are you Dr. Branham? I said, no, ma'am. No, no, no. I said, I'm Brother Branham. She said, I'm charmed. And she held that hand out there with enough gold on it to send a dozen missionaries around the world. And she held her hand way up like this. Now, that's no way to get a handshake. I reached up and got a hold of that big fat hand and got it. I said, bring it down here so I'll know you want to see it. <laughs> I like a good old handshake, don't you? Let's give one another that while we sing I Love Him Again. Everybody now. Ah, God. Until I see you again, God bless you. Now let's raise your hands to Him. Ah.